Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Games for Change Talk and Play in partnership with MIT Press, featuring a very special book launch of Locally Played by Benjamin Stokes. My name is Marissa and I am the Programs and Operations Manager at Games for Change. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat button. You can use this feature to chat with other attendees. Next to that button, you will see a Q&A feature. Use this to ask our speakers questions. Keep in mind that we will answer questions during the last 20 minutes. I also want to remind you that we are recording this talk and play. With all that being said, I'd like to introduce, well, reintroduce the president of Games for Change, Susanna Pollock. Take it away. Thank you, Marissa. All right, so everyone kind of knows how this is all gonna work. You've got the chat button, most people are using that. And then the Q&A, which is a separate click, a, a separate tab on the bottom. You're welcome to add questions um, as the session goes on, but then Katie at the very end as a moderator is gonna um, refer to those questions, all right? So if you can remember to use the chat, the Q&A for questions, that'll be great. Otherwise, um, we'll find you one way or another. Um, Okay, so uh, so I'm Susanna. Um, I can see a bunch of people who are here today who I know, uh, but for those of you who um, we haven't met before, um, I'm president of Games for Change, and we are uh, thrilled to have this session today. Not only are we presenting to amazing, um, talented, and inspiring people, we also are hosting uh, Benjamin Stokes, which is one of the co-founders of Games for Change. Uh, Ben, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So that I'm, I'm super, super thrilled and excited to be able to host you. Um, before I go into their introductions, um, I'm going to first do a little uh, announcement about the Games for Change Festival, which is coming up uh, in just two weeks. Um, maybe we can just throw a slide up there about that. But if you um, aren't part of our newsletters or, or heard about the game, this session from elsewhere, um, just to let you guys know that our annual event will be held on July 14th to the 16th. Um, it's virtual and free for this for the first time ever. Um, so um, hopefully you can come and check out some of the sessions. Um, we're going to be programming over 150 speakers across three days, focusing on tracks of how games can foster resilience, interconnectedness, and uh, well-being. We'll be talking about health games. We'll be talking about um, uh, games and health uh, and education, and of course, how games can help uh, raise awareness um, around civic and social issues and help build a better world. So I hope you all see see you then. I'm Marissa or Archit. It would be awesome if you can just send a link through to how people can register. Uh, that'll be great. Um, okay, so now I'm going to do a quick intro. Um, although um, my colleagues probably don't need much of an intro. They both have been uh, tremendous influencers in building the community around games and impact. Um, ben is not only a game des designer and a city researcher, as I mentioned, he co-founded Games for Change, um, and he is the author of the brand new book, Locally Played, Real World Games for Stronger Places and Communities, which MIT Press uh, publishes. MIT Press has been one of the uh, leading publishers that brings together game developers, academics, and, uh, and impact and learning together. Um, they're also the publisher of Katie Salen's uh, book as well. Um, we, uh, we also want to acknowledge that Benjamin Stokes is an assistant pro uh, professor at the School of Communications uh, with American University, um, where he directs the Playful City Lab. Um, and then he has a long background working in foundation work with MacArthur Foundation um, and with museums such as the Smithsonian and the Guggenheim. Um, he is going to be interviewed today by Kaylee, uh, Katie Salen, um, who is a professor at the Department of Informatics at the University of California at Irvine. And she's also a member of the Connected Learning Lab and chief designer and co-founder of Connected Camps. Um, we're very happy to be partnering with Katie on a program called Raising Good Gamers, um, which we're going to be launching at the Games of Change Festival. Um, so Katie, um, in, in addition to being the executive director, the founding executive director of Institute of Play, um, she has been involved with and everything from Connected Learning Research Network and led the design of Quest to Learn, uh, an innovative New York City public school. 
Um, she's an author herself, of course, of Affinity Online, How Connection and Shared Interest Fuel Learning, Rules of Play, and the Game Design Reader. So, Katie, I know um, you're going to lead us through a fantastic conversation with Ben, and thank you both for your time. Um, and I encourage everyone to pick up Ben's book after the session is over. Katie, over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. It's so, uh, I feel like we're among friends. I see so many familiar faces over there in chat. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to talk to Ben about this book because I've been sort of tracking its progress for a number of years. And I just think it's a super interesting book and really well-timed. Um, so today, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to ask Ben some questions. We're going to have some back and forth. Um, I know Susanna said, or Marissa said, to hold your questions till the end. But as they come up, ask your question. I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A. And if it feels like I can sort of slip one in partway through, I will do that. Um, we also have some kind of uh, audience participation part of the day planned uh, a little bit later. So uh, we'll hopefully get some feedback from you guys about that. And then we're going to open it up for um, Q&A later. So Ben, my very first question to you is sort of, why did you write this book? Well, thank you, Katie. And also, um, thank you, Sana and Games for Change. It's really exciting to see how Games for Change and has grown in the festival with the online and free version. I'm really excited to see where it goes this year. Uh, I, I do also think it's very timely, the themes that you've chosen. And I think they dovetail with some of the themes of the book, which I feel like I should do a little like promotion holding it up. Here's the actual thing. It's so exciting to hold it uh, in my hands after it is, it's been uh, five plus years that I've been uh, working on this 10, if you count some of the examples on it. And, and I think that's, that shows some of the passion that I have for the topics in the book. Uh, some of it has to do with cities, but I think more it's about communities, uh, place-based communities, and, and how important they are to me. Um, but I think right now it's also how important they are uh, to uh, uh, the future of uh, so many of us. It's, it, it's not just where the majority of the world's population uh, is, is headed towards living, um, but it's also, I think, the recovery around COVID is going to happen in public space and navigating some of those dynamics uh, is, is crucial uh, to recognize the foundation at the social and network level. Um, and I think that so often with technology, uh, at which games are obviously related, uh, we think about the user, we think about the individual. Um, for me, this book was born out of a desire to think about empowerment at the group level, not just about giving individuals the skills they need to be stronger and to, to fight for the things that are important to them, but really at the level of the community. Um, and, and I think that that's also because we can see such systemic problems uh, at the level of geography and communities. We know that the zip code that you're born in uh, predicts so many life outcomes that are incredibly important and sometimes really, really awful. Um, uh, life expectancy, educational attainment, uh, all sorts of mental and even environmental outcomes uh, can be predicted based on zip code, which ties closely to communities and community networks. Uh, so I think that this is a kind of empowerment that, that is, is in some ways new to Games for Change, although it's not at all new to community organizers in every city that you go to right now. And I think over the past few weeks, we've seen this particularly, uh, protests mobilize existing networks. Uh, these are not uh, people that just met each other for the first time. Um, there are networks and organizations, there's civil society, there's all sorts of work going on. And I think that the fact that we need to do more also says something to a role that I think games can play. And that's a little of where the book came from. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that the, um, the unit of analysis looking at this notion of transformative change in the community is what was one of my big takeaways from the book. Um, the other thing I think that you do that's so useful as you, as you wrote the text to sort of move through it is you focused on some specific examples of games. Um, and so I thought we could start by having you tell us, give us some examples of what are these games that you're talking about that operate at the community level, are locally situated, take advantage of networks, um, and also in some cases are digital and physical. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I did try to do some of that storytelling. I really tried to structure the book around a series of, of longer stories um, rather than give kind of a litany of all the possible games that can exist out there. Uh, artists have been doing really interesting games in physical space for, for a very long time. 
But as I said before, at the group level, where there are communities uh, either engaged or building uh, the game, some of that, some new possibilities are emerging with technology. And of course, I think Pokemon Go uh, has to be mentioned quickly um, because that's what I start with if I start talking with a city, like an, uh, city planners, for example, come to me and they say, why should I care about games? And I say, Pokemon Go, they, they, we can start the conversation, <laughs> even if the actual game is going to have nothing, will look nothing like Pokemon Go. Uh, it's a way to, to have a, a shared vocabulary. Um, and I think that games have such interesting cultural barriers uh, where people identify as gamers that, and, and other people who play a lot of games may insist that they are not gamers, uh, that we, we talk past each other, let alone sports, which are in cities at such uh, large scale already. Uh, sports, bowling, uh, what we play hopscotch in, in front of our, our houses. So play is everywhere in cities. Uh, but when as soon as we talk about video games in the digital, it often drops off. That's why I started with some storytelling. I didn't start with Pokemon Go, though, because I really feel like we have to start with a, a somewhat less digital example uh, that respects existing communities deeply. Uh, for that, I started with a, a, a game called Making Money, um, and it was a game that came out in 2010, 2011. It was funded by the Knight Foundation um, for about half a million dollars. So it was a pretty big investment. And a lot of that went into understanding the community, understand, working with existing organizers that are in Macon. Uh, I mean, Macon, Georgia is a distinctly Southern city. Uh, it has very particular dynamics of race and class. Uh, that, that had to be attuned to. But why don't I actually show you a little bit of the game, um, since I think that's uh, some of the challenge. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, let's see if this does it. Um, all right. And present. Um, so what you're looking at are a few different images um, of the game. Uh, this is a, a game that was uh, designed to help connect different parts of the community where there were some really uh, significant barriers uh, to people connect, knowing each other, talking to each other. And in particular, there was a college community, uh, Mercer uh, University, that was not especially well connected to a historic African-American community. Uh, and as the Knight Foundation was trying to invest in building a, a downtown corridor that could serve all of the uh, different uh, groups in Macon, uh, this game was, was developed to help bridge some of those connections. Um, let me play a quick video um, uh, the, the, uh, d that shows, it's a promotion video, it shows a little of the feel. Okay, I think you need to present then. For some reason it didn't go into present. Oh yes, yeah, so Ben, we're not seeing that. Okay, that video didn't come through. Yeah, why don't you try pressy? For some reason, when you kick present, it didn't show. Okay. Uh, it didn't try going into present mode again. Try one more time. Yeah. I, I, I'm gonna jump in here because mm -hmm. I found that if you do present, you cannot see a video, but if you keep it in the, in the unpresent mode, you can. Okay, let's try this. I'll try one more time. Give me a thumbs up, Katie, if it's working. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, what, what you, I didn't want to say too much before showing the video, but hopefully a few things popped out. It didn't feel super digital. In fact, they're physical objects. They're, there's this currency, the Macon Bonds, which if you find two matching pieces, you can trade it in and support local business. Um, the little twist comes that you only get one half of the bond at a time. And so the organizers very strategically distributed those bonds across different communities. And you had to often come together in public space to find somebody who had matching symbols. There were duplicates, 
uh, so that uh, you could uh, you would find more than one person had a match, uh, but but there was some scarcity as well. This is the, the kind of thing that games do a good job at uh, creating some kind of scarcity, some uncertainty about exactly where things will go and wh and what will happen uh, in them. Uh, at what you see at the bottom left in the in the image uh, is a Sunday concert series that was already being designed. Uh, and run in the city uh, on what they, they sometimes refer to, and I saw this in some of my interviews, as the most segregated day of the week. Uh, and this was because on Sunday there were African American churches and white churches that often didn't mix. And so part of the organizing that was already going there was can we offer a music concert series that brings people together and the game piggybacked on this. There was a lot of embedding in existing social activities, finding the bonds in local businesses and so on. Um, final thing just to mention is that although this was initially thought of as, as a kind of community engagement game, because there was a direct uh, use of funds for local businesses. In fact, more than $60,000 were injected into the local economy. You can actually measure this in terms of economic policy and economic development. Uh, and I think it was actually a much more micro-targeted form of economic policy than what cities usually do with tax breaks and economic development zones. This is a much more interesting way to support local businesses and build social connections with that relationship between social capital and uh, monetary capital. And how long did the game run for? Uh, it, it ran for just a matter of months. Uh, so it was, uh, I think, uh, six or eight months uh, in its duration. Um, and during that time, some people came back and they found a number of matches, uh, while uh, other people tried it once and had kind of a fun experience getting a match, meeting someone they hadn't met before. Uh, and I think that there was, in, in that sense, for some people, it was a fairly short experience. For others, it was a longer experience. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, it's a, the game design, I think, does a really great job of um, providing multiple ways for people to play, right? So people that just wanted to have a little, kind of a little bit of a taste, and that little taste could still be incredibly meaningful. I think in your book, you talk about just some of the relationships, these moments of meeting somebody to, that you have a match with, and the conversations that ensued around that, that kind of bridging work, social bridging work that's happening between people. It's, it's also interesting, I think, from a, a, a real world impact, which is a, a term that I use in the book multiple times, the idea of real world games and real world impact. Um, because we know that if somebody visits a business for the first time, that's a huge barrier uh, that once they get over, they're much more likely to return. And so some of the research that, that we did on, on this game uh, showed that about half of the people visited a business they'd never been to before. Uh, and then I think the really exciting thing is of those that visited a business they hadn't been to before, over 90% of them went there after the game was over. So in the six month period after the game was over, they went back. And I think this is really interesting because this, in this way, the game is uh, setting the stage for future action, even though they aren't being rewarded. So it's not a direct one-for-one -one incentive. It's kind of getting over that hump, especially if, if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable in a neighborhood, but you want to go, you want to connect. Uh, the game can be kind of an excuse to follow through on your intentions. Yeah. And were there business owners that didn't want to accept bonds? What, what was that process like of businesses deciding that they were going to accept or not accept or be part of the game or not be part of the game? So this is a, a crucial question of trust with a, a new thing coming to town. And we know that especially in communities that have been historically marginalized, these questions of trust are really important. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I don't think a game designer can just drop in and do a game with no existing uh, relationships. So the way that, that trust was brokered was partly because the funder, the Knight Foundation, uh, had a bunch of partners on the ground uh, who lived in the community. They actually have a program officer who lives in, in Macon itself, uh, brokered a lot of those relationships. Um, of course, these things are always complex and complicated. Uh, there, there's, I'm, I'm sure some of them wondered, am I going to possibly get a small business grant or loan? from night if I do this project. Um, but at the same time, it, it, they were brokered through kind of conversations. And I think that there was a feel that it's a little bit like a buy local initiative. Uh, put your name on, why not be part of this list? It did, however, have some additional effort that was required. The businesses had to uh, support some of the um, going and cashing in the bonds that they received. And did you have a sense in sort of talking to people about the game, did they feel like the game was theirs? or that the game is something that they, that had been given to them? That's that a, makes sense. That's a great question. Um, that sense of, of ownership um, 
and, uh, and, and how people engage with the game, uh, I think is crucial. The, the Macon bonds that you saw there, uh, obviously the name of the town is in the game. So Macon money, uh, like Macon, Georgia, but also Otis Redding, uh, one of the most famous natives of Macon was on the currency. And people got really excited about that. Uh, in fact, there were people that uh, didn't want to trade it in because they wanted to have the, the piece of currency as something they could uh, show their friends and family, even put on their wall. So that's partly a credit to the graphic designer who, who did kind of an amazing job. But it's also a way in which invoking the identity of the community is so important if you want to have credibility and that kind of connection. It's also something we know about strong communities, that strong communities have that group identity. Uh, we, here's Macon and I feel a part of it. Both of those are things that social scientists can actually measure. Uh, is there a strong community identity and do people feel a sense of belonging to it? Um, th that was something that, that uh, was looked at in some of the evaluation research done and the chapter talks about some of that, but I think that it's also something that game designers, uh, they, it worked because the game designers took that seriously. Yeah. Okay, so Make It Money is an example of a fairly non-digital game um, that was very connected to identity of place and people's connection had to do with where they were from. Can you move to maybe a second example that maybe references um, yeah, it's connecting to players for different reasons, like let's say popular culture or nostalgia. I think your Pokemon Go example references this a little bit. You want to talk about Pokemon Go? Yeah, um, that, I think that's a, um, a good uh, direction to, to take things um, because Pokemon Go, in some ways, uh, I would, would argue that it, it is fundamentally uh, different than a lot of the artist games that were considered so bold and exploratory with mobile media, uh, where they were games played by 10 or 20 people. Amazing small experiences, but, but in some ways what made Pokemon Go such a phenomenon is that it inherited this franchise of popular culture where people had these deep connections to the franchise and to the nostalgia of their youth uh, as much as anything else. And, and I think that this is a, uh, for me, this was an important question about how much is it uh, how much is video games and popular culture something that, that communities can own? Um, because if cities matter and they, we don't want them to all look the same, if we don't want a Starbucks on, uh, on every, uh, every corner to feel identical, I mean, I love Starbucks on occasion, but I also want um, Houston to feel different than Washington, D.C., a real question is, can we take something like Pokemon Go and localize it? Um, localize it beyond just GPS coordinates, coordinates but localize it to, to culture. Uh, and, and empower people that are that are working with it. So, uh, an example that I wanted to um, share um, looks at um, how several different cities, uh, including San Jose, Philadelphia, um, uh, took Pokemon Go and uh, appropriated it, remixed it in a certain way. Here is a, a what you're looking at on the screen uh, is a, a, an event, an open streets event called Viva Calle uh, that happens in San Jose um, every year already. And the interesting thing is it didn't start with the game. It already had 100,000 people that would come out, came out in the year before Pokemon Go was there. Um, and it looks something like at the top left. Uh, so it doesn't look particularly digital. It's like closing the streets to cars, bikers are coming out. Uh, and you can see the, the map, map at the bottom left shows some of the route that, um, that was taken by the bicyclists and walkers, and it tried to highlight cultural spots within San Jose. So they were already doing this, but they added Pokemon Go in for a special day, and they, and they did all sorts of things like uh, add something like 130 additional Pokestops. Uh, so they're adding to the digital geography of the place, um, but they also did a lot of organizing work um, to make it an interesting experience and even to bring in some special Pokemon characters that might draw people from other states and far away. And sure enough, uh, more than 35,000 players turned out for this one day event. So that's a significant draw. Um, but I, I think you can also measure it again economically. Those players contributed nearly half a million dollars into the local economy on that one day. And this is based on a pretty massive study that was done in San Jose um, that was uh, with people with, with surveys uh, checking every person going by. So looking how much the bikers and the walkers how, were contributing to the local economy. But the players, it's a pretty, it's a pretty massive um, amount. I wanted to show just a, a couple other images of what was happening in other cities, partly for the contrast. Um, here are some of the Pokemon Go players. Um, and one of the things you'll see from, from these, the image um, is that there, there, there's a lot of um, 
groups that are, are male and female, groups that are different ages, the crossing of generations with Pokemon Go, I think was particularly interesting uh, and is a particular challenge with digital forms of engagement about how do we reach across generations. Um, on, uh, what you'll see at the top left again was the map of the, of the route, but at the bottom right is a player generated map of the same route, but it shows some of the spawning area for different Pokemon that are of particular value. And so what's interesting is players already have their own geography and, the, and uh, where they understand space, not just in terms of what's a local asset for culture, but what's a local asset in the game. Uh, and by bringing the two together, uh, it, there are opportunities to see how the interplay between the two can help build uh, a sense of what is that place for both outsiders visiting and the people who live there, but might not have, uh, have seen another dimension. One of the things that was really great was that the city uh, started putting out uh, lures, uh, so a, a tr attraction uh, features in the game uh, along the route. To, and that was partly so that the, the route would be more interesting for players. But a lot of players started doing this too. And that was, they did it for the opposite reason. They wanted their fellow players to discover more culture along the route. So players were doing their own kind of fan-based organizing uh, to try and make the, the local geography of the real place interesting to other players. There's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer organizing. And I think that these complex dynamics are part of what I think is most interesting. A lot of cities just looked at the game as an incentive system. Can we just get people here, turn on Pokemon Go and they'll all show up. But actually the most interesting impact often happened um, when players and leaders in player communities were, were doing kind of that mobilizing work at the local level. One more picture uh, to show here. Um, there's the uh, adding in content to the game. Um, oh, and, and here's in Philadelphia, um, some, of the, some of the players turning out for an event that was there. Uh, I did wanna just mention Philadelphia because there was a remix there where they made paper versions of a, a kind of treasure hunt that could happen through the game. And in this way, made the, uh, some of the same experience accessible to non-players. Uh, you could also play the paper version, uh, who, even if you didn't have a, an app or a data plan. Um, and so there, there was huge variety in how different cities were adapting Pokemon Go, but we can measure kind of whether that tied into local communities and, and, and connected back to local culture. Just another example. And this is an interesting model of a game that it, it's um, for people that live in that community, but there's this intentional pulling other people into the city. So people descend on the city, right, for a day and then they sort of leave. And it's this question of sort of what are they, you know, kind of what experience can they, they have that they can take a little bit of piece of that city. And in a way, I think probably less like Macon in terms of trying to establish longer term relationships and more about just kind of getting to know a place, yeah. right? Taking a, using play as a way to, um, yeah, kind of have a little mini vacation somewhere, right? That you might go play with, you know, play with your family, play with your friends um, in a place that maybe you never would have visited right yeah. through the lens of the game. There's, um, in San Jose, they really wanted people to come from all over and to know them as like a tech city. So having it connected to a game with a tech element was exciting for them. They said, bring in the rare Pokemon. Let's have legendaries. Let's get people from all over. Um, in Philadelphia, they said, actually, we really don't want a lot of strangers coming in. In fact, in some of our communities, a, a, a bunch of especially people who don't look like us descending on their streets with their phones was going to do the wrong kind of organizing. So in, in Philadelphia, some of the work that they did was to change the incentives to deliberately have less of a uh, many state kind of draw and appeal. Uh, and, and we can quantitatively show that that actually worked, um, that they were able to get a much more regional feel and also greatly increase the accessibility. So some of what's interesting to me is actually less that cities can do this, but more how different can the things that cities do, how different can that be? Can, can Philadelphia really do something that feels very different, even though it's the same game, Pokemon Go is the same game, they may re remix something else. And, and a treasure hunt, you know, isn't normally something in Pokemon Go. They're, they're adding this as a new game layer. They're almost adding a game on top of Pokemon Go uh, and playing multiple games at the same time. Um, of course, this happens in, in festivals and, and street events all the time where there, there's a lot of, of things going on. And we know that's often good for cities. Uh, it, it can just happen with, with digital games as well. Yeah, I mean, it's also the, just this idea that a city has a kind of awareness about mm -hmm what's going to work there, right? So there, what, there was a, you know, when Pokemon Go was first coming out, this kind of recognition that while it was being framed as like a game where anybody can go anywhere, that, it, that for, there were lots of people that couldn't go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. 
people of color entering a gated community, you know, an area, gated community area, their lives actually were at risk, right? And so there was a, law, a large kind of dialogue about talking about these kinds of games as really being open and accessible to everyone, right? It's visit, visit the world when in fact, there were a lot of communities that had barriers, like invisible barriers that, that you couldn't kind of see. So it's interesting where a city like Philadelphia would say, well, actually for us, that doesn't work, right? I always think about San Jose partially because it's like in that Silicon Valley corridor and they're just like, there's, they're used to like people descending into that city and sort of moving out, like coming and coming out where other cities that's sort of less, um, less sort of what their zeitgeist is, right? Or what they, what they feel comfortable with. Yeah. yeah. The, the um, demographics were also something that the cities could target. In San Jose, one of the challenges that they had was that compared to their actual population, they had a lot fewer Asians coming out to their open street events. So the city was actually really excited that Pokemon Go helped counterbalance that, mm. which is another kind of effect that we don't think of games as doing. Games can counterbalance demographics at large events. But actually that's some of what happened in San Jose is it shifted the demographic balance of an event uh, to bring in a group that, that, that the city really wanted to, uh, to have in their, in their public space. So uh, yeah, there, I think that if anything, it's the opportunities are as complex as cities because the games are layered on top of our cities rather than think of them as something separate uh, that happens just for gamers or just over there, they're, they're integrated and there's a lot of complexity in here. I think going, listening to the gamers is one big, big lesson. Uh, San Jose also did, did, uh, invited some uh, pretty serious Pokemon Go players to be kind of co-organizers with them. And, mm -hmm. and I think that this is also recognizing that so much of the work happens at the level of the, the players and the organizers, not just the game designers. Right, interesting. Yeah, I'm also, we're going to have a COVID question here in a minute, but the, <laughs> I'm struck by those pictures of like people jammed together in public gatherings, like, oh, wistfully, are we ever, are we ever going to get back to that? <laughs> um, yes, I think, uh, so we started with Make It Money, moved to Pokemon Go, which is a kind of hybrid. Um, let's move to Commons New York NYC and talk about the really the, the kind of most digital example, the sort of data layer example. Can you talk a little bit about that game, give people a sense of what that one was about? Yeah, um, well, here's a, uh, so Commons uh, was a game that was made in 2011 and shout out to Games for Change. It was a winner of a uh, competition that they had for real world games uh, with the Come Out and Play Festival. Uh, it was kind of a joint, uh, uh, a, competition that they had. And this was a game that was designed for New York. It could only be played there. And in fact, you can't even play it over all of Manhattan. You unlock neighborhoods as you go. Um, you play on a Saturday with like a, a team of people. Um, and uh, the challenges are, are a little bit like using a, a 311 system um, or like a pothole reporter, except that um, you, can set, you can both submit problems with the city, you know, a quest that might send you uh, to try and, and find something like some graffiti that's offensive in some way. Um, but it can also say find some public art. Um, and of course, the interpretation of what's good public art, as we're seeing with uh, the, the, all the discussion of statues uh, uh, today, uh, is something that, that changes over time um, and changes partly on, based on different communities. Um, so I, I think this is a, a, a way in which the human side of the data is part of what's really interesting. Let me show a, a screenshot um, from the game. Um, so um, let's see, are you seeing the mm -hmm. game? Yes, excellent. So uh, at, the, at the left, you're seeing a screenshot of the game, which is kind of the zoomed out view where you can see some of the different neighborhoods uh, and teams would play on an afternoon and they would have to be strategic because you could only choose which neighborhood you're going to unlock next. Uh, and so you move as a group into the next, next neighborhood once you've accrued enough points. Um, when you went to submit something, you were, to, you were gonna propose um, something like, um, I, I, what, I see a problem on Church Street, it's too much garbage. Um, uh, when you go to propose, the little twist is that the game only lets you submit if you also vote on other submissions from other teams. So there's suddenly, uh, and more points go to the teams with the, the kind of most interesting or, or, or uh, vote getting uh, entries. There's a feedback mechanism uh, that begins here uh, and the players quickly start to become aware that they can optimize their choice of what data they're collecting um, based on 
how how they the, how they position themselves in pictures and how they caption them. It's not super in, intense data collection. It's it's a picture plus a caption. But people quickly realized they if they put themselves in the in the picture, um, they started getting more votes. There was a kind of humanizing of the data that happened in a really interesting way. Uh, and for me, there are a, a growing number of these apps that are kind of like civic data apps, which cities are really excited about, uh, that they are investing in. They're in fact paying significant sums of money to, to keep running in some cases. Uh, and millions of submissions are happening, but it's kind of democracy as complaint. We're just gonna complain about things. Here, people are, are engaged with the issues. They're putting themselves in the, in the situation and, and the picture. And, and it's affecting the data stream in that um, as people start sorting and organizing, uh, it, it led to much in, more interesting and high quality data to submit to the city. One last thing to mention, uh, which is just that the players in kind of debriefing sessions afterwards uh, said that what they were really excited about uh, was that the, both having a fun, uh, fun time on a Saturday, um, but also that the city might actually look at the things that they'd taken pictures of. That was something they brought up again and again and again. Um, they really wanted the city to pay attention. And I think that um, this is something that uh, we sometimes forget in game design. We make we think of the feedback loop as just happening within the, the literal game, um, but actually with games with real world impact, it, the, the big G game system, the, the ecology of the game, is, as you've talked about sometimes, Katie, it, it involves more than just what the player and the screen are interacting with. And some of their big motivations might be having impact. If we can show them impact, not just in terms of points, but also, you know, hey players, here's what happened two weeks ago. The city got, uh, you played the game and now the city has looked at all the data and here's a couple things they've done. That's a feedback loop that I think is of growing interest to a lot of cities in the, in the so-called smart cities um, movement. A lot of cities are very interested in how they can gather that kind of data. And, and I would argue that, that games are a really interesting way to think about the to ways of structuring the participation so that it's engaging and people are tied into that, that feedback loop in a social way. Yeah, it does seem like the um, it got over that hurdle of just feeling like people were being exploited for their labor, right? That there there was something they were not only personally getting something about it out of it in terms of their play experience, but they felt like that they had a hand in making change in their city because of that feedback, as you said. Um, how quickly did the city provide you know sort of act on compl I guess their complaints, act on complaints, or what was the what was the sort of timeline for that? So it was, it, it, even though the game was tied to New York City's first chief data officer, so they had pretty high level connections there, um, it, it, it actually did take some back and forth and kind of nudging them. And it's not for lack of goodwill, but it's kind of like there's always all these internal initiatives that take up time and attention. Um, and so I actually think that some of the same problems with getting the city to pay attention to things like potholes in poorer neighborhoods too, not just the richer neighborhoods, also are going to play games as opposed to the purely functional utilitarian tools, which do kind of just the minimum of letting people complain, but don't provide that kind of engagement. Um, I, I think it, the, the, the lo long answer to your question is that uh, there was no direct reporting up uh, on, on what actions were taken beyond having the data kind of merge with their data stream. That's kind of where a lot yeah. of it stopped. And I think that that's, um, that leaves open real ethical questions. You, you hinted at some of these and playbore is a great term I, I love to, to invoke to think about how does our play do labor that is kind of unpaid and, uh, and unremunerated. Uh, I borrow that, that notion uh, and talk about it a little in the book. And I think that uh, games with real world impact have this as a particular concern. We have to think about uh, how, how, what is kind of the return. Um, but for the players, some of that return actually happened in the debrief sessions, which often were at bars. So you hung out on a Saturday running around the city and doing these things, but then at the end you got to talk to other players and, and, and slideshows that show some of what we submitted and got to, and, and when we get to talk about it with each other is actually a kind of alternative to some of the current uh, town hall forums, which are gosh awful boring, right? Uh, here's something that's, that's fun, people are having a drink and they're talking about how their city needs to change. What are some of its assets? It ties into asset-based development questions. What are some of its problems? So in some ways they got a return just with, with that kind of organizing as an event. Uh, and certainly the city also got some data. So I think that these are not clean answers. There's, there's always risks, I think, of some of the ethics questions that you raise. Uh, and, and I think they're only going to continue uh, to persist, but I think there are also some interesting answers. Yeah. 
All right, so let's get to the COVID question. <laughs> so I'm trying to think as we're talking like, you know, contact tracing is clearly, we have a real, real need around contact tracing. So could we, you know, could a game like this be developed to help with contact tracing? Uh, you don't need to answer that question, but we were brainstorming the other day. What if we took COVID this moment as a design challenge to say, okay, given that this current circumstances around physical distancing, a real need for social connection, issues around not being able to, you know, germs, not wanting to touch things. What are the kinds of interfaces, game mechanics, types of things that we might think about that might be sparked by just the circumstances of COVID that people could imagine integrating into games like this, local, locally played games? Yeah. Well, I mean, on one hand, there is, of course, the technological challenge of having people just close to each other, but also touching the same thing. Um, public space is going to have to deal with some of this with any interface, any screen embedded in public space. Um, and, and I think that that's a, there's some interesting technology opportunities, uh, including things like distance sensors, motion sensors, um, texting into a, to an interface that, that's shared. Um, uh, but, and, and on the technology side, there's some fun, fun opportunities. I think we're just starting to investigate like the same tap cards that are used uh, to get on buses or a lot of uh, metros can be used with a Raspberry Pi in public space. And then you're only touching your own card, but you could kind of check into to a space. And there are ways to play with anonymity and privacy in some of those settings. Um, uh, that, that I think are, are pretty interesting. So technology is a little piece of it, but I think just to step back for a second and, and think about how um, kind of resilience is often, is both an individual thing, but it's also a group thing. And, and this is a book where I really tried to think about things like resilience and COVID um, as a group response, not just an individual response. Um, and so like as an individual, we always worry about like our privacy and, and, and who has my data, but as a group, we really want our group story to be known. And in fact, we can only shift social norms and say like, should we wear masks? Um, should we actually disclose information when we're doing contact tracing so that it can help the greater good? I think if the, if the group is, is around us and with us. So some of, I think the, the, the most important starting point, I think is asking that kind of group level, how do we stay resilient as a group? Um, and, and the book provides kind of some frameworks for that, partly about networks, partly about group identity. Um, it's also about like group efficacy, the sense that if we do this together, we can win. Um, that I think games are really good about at boosting that sense of agency. Uh, and we know it ties into civic life as well. When people think that their uh, civic engagement does something as opposed to a vote that is meaningless, um, they're much more likely to participate. So I think participation continues to be like a fundamental question uh, to democracy, but also things like COVID response and how people uh, decide how they're going to engage with that and building that sense of efficacy, um, partly by surfacing how we've done that before, surfacing a little history of, of we've come together uh, as a group and we have, we have one, games can, can do some of that. Um, and, and building that sense of we. Those are a lot of kind of like principles for it in terms of actual, but I think mechanics also raises all sorts of good questions. And uh, we can get into that as well. Yeah, I mean, so I live in Southern California and we're like, I'm in a particular kind of community. It's all faculty here and there's a lot of green space. And, but during the quarantine, you know, kids were absent. They were not outside, right? Because parents were keeping them inside the home. I remember in Italy, right, they were locked down. Kids literally could not go outdoors. And so there's this, then months of this kind of absence of visible play, right, beyond watching your own children play or them do, having like a play date with a kid on Zoom, right? And so what started to happen here over the past couple of weeks is sort of kids venturing out, right, in sort of small units, like in a sibling unit and trying to figure out how to play with other kids, but at a distance, right? And coming up with all kinds of interesting games and sort of like slowly, slowly, you're starting to see parents letting their kids play with other kids because of that sort of, just kind of a desperate need to feel a part of a community again. And like the children become a visible symbol, kind of symbol of that. And I've been amazed at the games that the kids come up with, um, where they could still play with each other, but be far apart, like shadow tag and some of those kinds of things that they just, they figure out the mechanics themselves. Like, oh, I can't touch you, but yeah, I can touch your shadow or, or that kind of thing, so. I think th those are, there are so many examples. And I think that actually, um, if one thing that I hope that book helps 
uh, accomplish is more cities thinking of these kind of playful tactics as something they should do early phase. Like this is a kind of organizing more cities should be doing. These games that, that the shadow tag you're talking about, there hasn't been nearly enough talk about it. There's been so much about like how to deal with your kids when they're like to keep them off your Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that there's, uh, but, but there are actually a lot of interesting play. And between two, I'll just mention really quickly uh, that I find, find really cool neighborhoods that did Zoom calls that, that were like for the block where people were kind of connecting as a bridge to when you return to public space, there's been some of that like, oh, now I met the adults in your family. So the kind of like social bridging, um, and there's a great game jam around Zoom games that, that's been going on, um, that, as just I mentioned. Another one, um, uh, in my neighborhood, people are putting teddy bears in windows, uh, and then parents would take walks with their kids and look at the teddy bears. Right. So I, I feel like they're, you mentioned a couple that those just, I, I bet as a group, we could get like 30, 40. I think that this is maybe one thing I try to emphasize in the book is that, that there's so many, there, there actually is so much play going on and so much that's out there. We're, we're very often only scratching the surface of that richness. Uh, and I think that cities could do well to reflect a little of that back, um, to be trying to show some of those, those stories as an invitation to engage with each other, uh, rather than to see that as kind of a distraction that parents can do to kind of take up of their kids' time. Um, I think that there are real benefits and outcomes. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, just because there, people have, are, have uh, had to slow down during the quarantine, and you know, often you're outside with your kids a lot more than you normally would have been, um, just like, paying attention to your local space in a way that you wouldn't have before. So lots of people that have been commuting are now like actually in their neighborhoods where they probably spent very little time and maybe outside in their neighborhoods and spending time in ways that they hadn't before. So yeah, it does feel like there's a kind of opportunity to sort of leverage that even as things start to go back to normal at some point of um, people kind of remembering <clears throat> just those feelings of experiencing something new in their neighborhood and connecting to neighbors in new ways and, you know, that play often facilitated those kinds of connections. Yeah, I'm just I, looking at the time. Do we, oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Should we, do you think we need to just jump to Q&A here in yeah, a minute? Yeah, let's jump to Q&A. Just, but one thing just to mention is I do think that if there's one thing about the power of play that I think is better than so many other, uh, that play does better than so many other things, it's that it opens, creates that kind of space for social interaction. And I think that, that if you wanna build networks, you wanna build strong networks and strong community, especially across difference, across lines of race and class or across age, that space uh, that play creates, I think is incredibly valuable. Uh, and I think that's where cities might need to see some of this kind of play as, as an investment, um, not just as something that, that is uh, fantastic for the park. Yeah, absolutely, great. Okay, so we can, um, we can take some questions now if you guys wanna put your question in the Q&A box, which is down in the lower, the lower middle, lower right. So there's a question from Mark. It says, it feels like there's opportunities at large and small scales for building communities with games. Do you think smaller games can scale up or that there are fundamental differences in their designs between sort of big and small games? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, and I'm like, look at the last chapter in the book. <laughs> The last chapter is kind of about the thinking about scale uh, and how scale works differently in cities. And I think one of our, we actually have some blinders on from video games where we think that success is to scale through these mass media channels like the app store. Um, but in some ways that often takes adaptation out of the process and it makes it replication. It means that every town downloads the same game and installs it. And more off, moreover, it's at the consumer level. So individuals downloading the game. Whereas I think a lot of these, the adoption is, is only secondarily at the level of the individual. The first kind of adoption is at the level of the community. Like if you're gonna do a block, a street festival, you don't, get, you don't ask individuals first. You ask like the community organizations, you get permission to close the street and then you ask people to come. So there's like a different phase in the adoption process. And I think that rather than see that as like additional uh, difficulties for doing the kind of scaling of games, we have to recognize that's actually a new channel with new sources of funding and actually new ways to distribute. So cities pay attention to each other kind of horizontally, not by looking at the app store. Um, with with the few, very few exceptions, you know, like Pokemon Go, you might get a thing that breaks through, but but actually that's not the goal. Um, 
things like uh, like parking day is a thing in, in the US at least, and I think it's probably in some other countries where people take over a parking space, sometimes pay the meter, but then do something wild in that space. Um, these kind of like tactical ur urbanism, small uh, um, innovations spread often kind of horizontally. So I think that there are different models um, and they, and not only, again, is it a different model for distribution, but it is, it comes with funding too. So one of the cool things is if you're looking for funding for games, thinking about how you can share practices across cities um, rather than get a toolkit that everyone uses, I think is a, a different way to think about um, scaling games at the local level. Yeah, so one thing that I, so I've done some of this work um, just sort of in my, in my past and um, it's actually not easy work. So, you know, I, I sometimes when I talk to people about the differences between doing this kind of design, which is really about investing in a community versus kind of designing a, a game that you give to a community, is that there, yeah, it's just a really different kind of work. Um, it takes more time. The trust building is huge. There's a lot of work just around building trust. There are, um, anyone that's tried to design for physical, physical infrastructure knows that just issues around permits and what you can and cannot, cannot do in public space can be really challenging. And maybe, so maybe you can talk about some of the other kind of bar maybe barriers to doing this kind of work or the kinds of uh, kind of mindset that you, you need to have to be able to do it. Um, well, I think that first of all, you should look at some of what Katie's done with some of the games that, that she's done, in, uh, including the, the big urban game in Minneapolis where they rolled a giant ball through the streets of the city, how you get permissions to do some, some of that kind of work, um, or your work with the, the karaoke, uh, the singing truck. Um, that, so some of these are, are things that I think game designers don't have a lot of experience doing those kind of like permitting and, and negotiating. And maybe they shouldn't. They should be do it done with community organizations who do this kind of stuff all the time. That's my first kind of lesson is partner and co-design as early as, as possible. Um, and to recognize that it does have work for each iteration. Um, I think that uh, if you were to ask people, should the next neighborhood pocket park be free? Well, they'd like it if it was, but they expect that they're gonna probably have to pay for landscaping. They're gonna have to pay for the, the grass. You're gonna have to pay. So the idea that each one is an investment, that's how physical space works. And maybe games at the local level are, are going to also uh, require some kind of investment for like the social connection and capital and permitting it. I, I think that, the, that in some ways, the disservice we do to ourselves is to, to think that they can scale like video games where you, you all the work is in the making it and then we, there's just some marketing budget that goes along with it. So I, I think that um, I, that's at least my experience. Katie, is that, does that match some of your experience and some yep. of the games that you've built? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just have to be um, clever <laughs> about how you, how, you sell, how you sell the idea to people and be really clear about the reciprocity. I think that is a, is a big learning is that you have to really think about Obviously you have kinds of goals for the work, but what really is the community getting out of it? What is it that they're taking away? What's the kind of longevity um, of the impact of the thing that you're doing with them? That, that feels like a really important piece. Okay, let me, I'm gonna take another question from the uh, Q&A. So this is from Leon. Mobile device augmented reality has been a technology that's empowered games for change. Are there other emerging technologies becoming more accessible that you're excited about in the next decade? Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the challenges is, is we've thought about video games as, from such a video perspective. So the, the more visual, the more pixels, the more immersion you can get, the better the, the game has been something that, uh, that I think is, is a temptation and it works with AR and VR uh, in some ways nicely. Um, but I think audio, for example, I think is another really interesting way. And I think the idea that um, audio augments much better. We can process audio while we walk. Uh, anyone that's used Google Maps knows that it's not a good idea to like hold the map up while you drive right in front of the screen. <laughs> but sometimes you want the voice, although the voice is also annoying. So we have to figure out how to like balance these inputs. I'm in, in a lot of ways very more interested in some of the mixed reality spaces than, than pure uh, augmented reality that's, that's uh, hyper visual. Um, so I think like the internet of things is a whole set of technologies. Uh, I think it has as much complexity as AR in a purely visual sense does in a whole bunch of different small spaces. Know, knowing when a bus is arriving, knowing how to turn on the lights across the way, how to turn on a fountain. There have been some cool projects in Mexico City with fountains where the water jets are turned on by, by games or by play. Um, so public sculptures that are interactive is something that, that I'm really excited about. Um, 
And, and I think that um, uh, uh, also the connection back to community conversations and even to young people's media production. You know, when, when kids do something cool in a school that they want to show with their community, how does the community ever see it? Um, there's often not a lot of reflection in public space of the work that young people are doing. Um, and so I, I think that, that that doesn't require um, necessarily a fancy technology, but more of like a connective technology. So I'm really excited about connective technologies um, that connect uh, nodes of learning or of experience or civic engagement to other nodes, um, museums and libraries in particular, so. Well, okay, let's get to another one here. So this one is about, um, social interaction. So how do you think about mechanics that work for social experiences between people that know each other versus people that don't know each other? Is there yeah. anything you figured out in the book about those maybe different mechanics? Yeah, well, some of it, I think that one of, for me, one of the biggest breakthroughs that I've had is thinking about um, privacy as not only something where we want to be as private as possible. And there's a lot of rhetoric right now that like we're worried about people getting our information so we want to be private but think about it if you never tell your neighbor your name do you get to know them actually trust is all about disclosure and vulnerability um and so i think that um this pivot from people we know and we already trust to people that we're trying to get to know um to me this also ties into some of the discussion, really important discussions we're having around race right now. Um, do people know their neighbors? Do they know just neighbors who look like them? How do we help people connect across lines of, of race and class? Uh, in uh, some of the Pokemon Go work, uh, one of the things I saw was that in San Jose, the players had, had learned the screen names of other people around them in play. Um, and other people who were there just to bike and walk mostly had not gotten up the nerve to actually learn the name of any of the people that they'd met. So in this sense, games have an advantage of, of sharing uh, kind of things like pseudonyms, which are, uh, they are personal and it's unique to me, but it's also not exactly my full name. It's a kind of in-between personal information. Um, and I think that this kind of brokering of semi-private information is a really interesting opportunity where games might be able to do better than even face-to-face -face events, where it's like meet a stranger, meet a stranger, which is like really kind of, kind of tricky. So again, this kind of opening space for conversation uh, and strangers, I think is a really exciting area. There are lots of games that, that do different things with this, but that's just one thing that I find I found pretty interesting. Yeah, you mentioned we did a, um, a this karaoke ice cream truck in San Jose, this project years ago. And what we discovered there is that you, you had to find a way for people to first feel connected to the experience. If they felt they were part of something with others, that was the first check mark. Once they felt that sense of belonging to the experience, so the case of karaoke is that they are, they got an icy pop. So they're like, got something free. They're excited about that. And they're watching somebody else karaoke. And be, by the very nature of karaoke, you're kind of cheering them on, right? You're, you're kind of a fan. Like nobody boos karaoke people, right? It's a super positive <laughs> community experience. And once, once they felt like part of the experience, they were much more likely to turn to the person next to them and ask if they would want to go sing with them or start talking to them about where they're from, that kind of thing. So that's the other thing I often think about with mechanics is that you, you want to first build that kind of feeling of community that gives people a feeling of safety and a sense of identity of I'm with this, I'm in this with this other person, which then gives them the freedom, right? The kind of permission. I talk about permission slips all the time. This kind of, it's a kind of permission to now invite them to do something else in the game. Yeah. Versus the making money one, which I actually, I think that takes, it takes a lot, would take a lot for me to go up to somebody I never had never met to try to match my money with them. That's like, a, that feels like a very high bar, but because it's very local, right? As you said, it was so grounded in the local vernacular and the kind of narrative of the place. And you, it already had a sense that this person is with me. They're from my community. Yeah. And in fact, you might be meeting them at an event like a concert that you went to knowing that other people were going to be there too. So I think the, the actual micro settings established some of that trust. That's part of what it made it work. In the book, I talk about um, meeting and greeting mechanics as things that in neighborhood settings, we need to repeatedly meet and greet people. And that's what like a mechanic is, right? A, an action that you're repeatedly doing to make some kind of progress in, in the game. Uh, and by the way, I've learned everything on, on mechanics, I, I feel like from rules of play. So um, thank you, Katie. But- um, Eric Zimmerman and, too. <laughs> um, yes, thank you, Eric. Um, 
but um, but but I think that the, 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 they are different also. Like gre greeting, you have to kind of know the person to greet, um, but only only in a small way. Whereas like meeting um, might be something that um, you can do kind of like. Uh, once you once you know them well enough to meet again in the future. So just thinking about like having a richer vocabulary for like meeting, greeting, and and, and what do we which one did we mean? Which one do we want to encourage? Can be a w great way to start a game design process and to think what does my community need? Do we need ways of of really doubling down on people that already know each other, or just building a little bit of the the greeting trust? Or what kind of situation can we create? Yeah, no, uh, so my analogy is I teach these large game design classes, like 170 people and my whole goal is for that 170 people to feel like they're a community by the end of the class because in the beginning they definitely are not right so these are students from all over campus they're freshmen to seniors and and they really you can you can their discomfort at trying to play with others is so visible visceral even at the start of the course and so there's things i do the kind of mechanics i use to start to build that community at the beginning of the course and then it gets to a place where they're, you know, they end up playing mafia as part of a midterm and like, which is a game that you can play with strangers, but you have to do some like kind of community building work to have that game be actually meaningful in some way. So I often talk to my TAs about the fact that, oh, we could never have done this at the start of the quarter. Like these activities would never have worked because they, these students don't yet feel part, you know, kind of part of something. So. So even from a design perspective, like trying to think about how you introduce students to that that sense of community through the kinds of activities that they're doing, you know, in a in a course. I think that, I think that yeah. it, it ties back also to cities and a little of the short term and long term. I think about the protests that we've seen, for example, recently in a, in a bunch of cities um, as 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 a needing as having mechanics and tactics of kind of confrontation and pushing, but. If that's all we do, we don't have a space to kind of build trust. So it's kind of how do we, when do we need a certain set of tactics and mechanics and when do we need another? Uh, and I think there's a kind of in the long term, there also has to be mechanics that build the, some of those trust uh, uh, relations, build vulnerability, help people talk, take risks. And then they can ask a neighbor or something about, oh, well, why did you just do that thing that's, that, that, that doesn't quite work for me? Or how can we work together to really fight for something that we both is in both of our, our shared interests? Um, the mechanics conversation, I think, is also something that's pretty distinct to games, uh, that if more like city planners asked, well, what's the mechanic of, of this like public meeting or engagement, we would have such richer uh, democratic conversations, I think. So, uh, so I'm hoping that like that we can continue to keep bring questions of mechanics to even non-game design audiences, even to policymakers. Yeah, great. So Sophia had a question that's a little bit related. So she says, how do you think about the longevity of games and their effectiveness? Is it that games catalyze other formal or informal types of civic engagement? Yeah, they, I think they can, but they can also be places of civic engagement themselves. Um, so for example, the organizing that was happening in Pokemon Go, the civic engagement is happening in the game. So it's like, where is the circle of the of the game? Is it really a separate space? In this book, I was really interested in that kind of deliberate blurring of, of the magic circle, as, some, as game folks sometimes talk about it. it. There is something of a separate space, but actually it's partly interesting because real world spaces, you can't be to have them be totally separate. That's unhealthy. And actually the players don't really want that either. They want them to be overlapping spaces. Um, and that leads to things like organizing Pokemon Go players uh, to be more civically engaged. And if you're organizing Pokemon Go players, are you doing civic organizing? Um, I, I think the, the, that's a kind of like possible long-term proposition. Uh, in addition, there are some very short-term, I think of uh, things like icebreakers. Who hasn't done an icebreaker? And as much as sometimes we roll our eyes because it's an icebreaker, there's a reason like they're done so widely to create that space for conversation at the beginning of events when we haven't met, met people. So I think that there's, uh, this is partly why, like, when we think about games as media, um, we're going to miss, like, the big picture. There's so many different kinds, the, the short little experiences to the longer term organizing, all of those are, are part of using kind of game and game mechanics around engagement. Um, and I think it's a really rich tool set uh, if people can think 
with that kind of breadth. Um, I think often starting with that question of time at the beginning of a design experience is particularly important though. Do we have people for an hour? Do we have them for five minutes? Um, do we have them for 10 minutes, but it's every Tuesday after a church meeting? Like those, those then lead to such different kinds of games. Uh, and those are the kinds of questions that real world kind of community organizers already have to deal with. Um, but I think game designers have sometimes thought, well, I'm just gonna make the content um, and, and the platform becomes assumed. So I, one takeaway from my book is like, don't assume the platform or the time, go and like figure it out with the community before you start building something. Yeah, okay. So we're at the top of the hour, we're a little bit late. So I just wanna give you a chance at the end to let people know where can they get your book and where can they follow you, find out more about your work. Um, well, the, you can go to my website, or I'll paste, I'll paste one in also. Um, the MIT Press uh, site has, um, I'll put it in the chat, a bunch of, um, where's the chat? Um, um, let's see, to attendees. Um, it has a bunch of different ways you can um, buy the book. If you want to do that, you can get it as, as a, uh, for an online reader or, or, or rent it. But I think I, I also would love people just to keep sharing their games and things they're doing. Uh, like there, there's a, we're in a moment with, with games and localism where they shouldn't all be the, the same. And I think there are so many really interesting contributions that um, I, I would love for people to send me their ideas of things they're working on um, or how our cities might, might share games uh, back and forth or even build funding for some of these as part of things like economic development in cities. Um, so yeah, great. Great. All right. Well, Ben, you are awesome. The book is really great. I really liked it. I will use it in my teaching. Um, so I, encu I encourage people to check it out. And I just appreciated being in conversation with you today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Katie. It's, it's, it's an honor. I, I've, I've known Katie for, uh, gosh, probably decades at this point. Um, and uh, it is, I, I feel like I'm always just trying to, to catch up to seeds of ideas that you've given me years before. So yeah. um, this yeah. has been fun to, to come back and, and have a conversation with you about how some of them came together with this book. Um, yeah, and, and thank you also to the audience. You guys are really great questions. I've captured a screenshot of the, the, unfortunately, the questions that we didn't get to answer. I'm so sorry. I was, I was not picking them for because some were better than the others. It was more just trying to make some, so, some coherence to the conversation. But thank you so much for everyone who joined. Um, and then Marissa, did you want to say something at the end? Yes, I just wanted to thank you so much, Ben and Katie, for such an interesting conversation. Um, we will be following up with all attendees with links to the book, um, a link to this video if you want to reference it again, and perhaps we can reference the questions that were not answered. Um, but thank you so much again. Um, the next event that Games for Change has is the virtual festival. We hope to see you all there. And thanks again, guys. <laughs> okay, bye everyone. Bye, Ben. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.